like to welcome all of you to an hour of presentations about the chemistry of life. So I'm going to be talking about the chemical reactions that go on in each and every one of the cells in your body. But a lot of these reactions take place on such a small scale that we can't observe them directly. So I'm going to be using some of the demonstrations I use when I teach freshman chemistry, which are more macroscopic. That means they're big. We can see them. And I'll be using those and relating those to the chemistry that goes on inside of all of the cells of your body. So if we're going to talk about biochemistry, we better start out by asking the question, what is chemistry? Does any of you kids have an idea? How about over here? The, the chemistry is the study of chemicals. That's pretty good. Let's see if we can expand on that a little bit. Somebody else have an idea? The study of what? Down here in front. The study of chemical reactions. That's good. So it's the study of both. Go ahead, over here. Good. So these are all good definitions. The study of solids and liquids and one more. What's the other form of matter? Yeah. Other state of matter, gases. Study of solids and liquids and gases and how they're put together and how they react. So we're going to be talking about what's called chemical reactions. Now, to start with, a lot of, we mentioned reactions that take place in the gas phase. Let's illustrate one of those reactions. There are a lot of chemists here on the CU campus who are interested in atmospheric chemistry. So they're worried about pollutants in the air and global warming and other features of the gases in the atmosphere. So I'm going to start out by showing you a non-biochemical demonstration. And I have some balloons here. And you may not be able to see the third one down here on the ground. I'll tell you that that green one is filled with air. I blew that up myself this morning. So that's why it's not rising up. What do you think might be in the yellow or the pink one over here? Helium. Now, why did you say helium? Why does helium make the balloons float? Does it have some magic floating power, or is there something very simple that makes helium make balloons float? How about here in the green? You, yeah. It's lighter than air. So helium is a good guess because helium is a common gas that's lighter than air. But now I'm going to tell you something. There's something different in those two balloons. So helium's one guess, but we better have at least one other guess here in the orange. Hydrogen. Why did you say hydrogen? Because it's lighter than air, too. OK? Any other guesses? Anything other than hydrogen and helium? How about over there? Yeah. You don't know. OK, well, that's always a, when in doubt, I don't know, is always a safe thing to say. Let's, now how are we going to decide whether there's hydrogen or helium in these? Somebody have an idea? Over here. Yeah. OK, so that's an excellent answer. We could talk, of, we could do something that would measure the weight of the balloon because hydrogen is lighter than helium. Of course, we'd have to make sure that the balloons were the same, what? Same size to make it a fair measurement. And we weren't that careful when we blew them up. So what else could we do? Over here in the blue. Yeah. Would you like to do that for me? <laughs> How about a volunteer from the audience? So the suggestion was that we should do an experiment, OK? And we should look at the chemical reactivity. How about you in the orange right up here? And I'd like you to put this on. We always are very safety conscious when we do these experiments. So here. And whoa, 
a little bit of a size problem here. Let's, these were not last used by a kid. OK. And what we have here, who knows what this is? Yes. Yardstick with, yeah, well, or meter stick. OK, good. We're using the metric system. <laughs> Actually, it doesn't matter what kind of a stick this is, but it has what on the end of it? A candle. Good. So let's do an experiment here. And now remember, the experiment we're doing is to ask the question, is this hydrogen or helium? So I would like you to hold this, stand back, and hold it to the pink balloon. Now don't, don't be nervous, OK? <laughs> Well, what happened? Hydrogen or helium? Helium. OK, thank you very much. Let's give a hand here and for your help. Now, I need one more brave volunteer from the audience. How about you right here? Step right up. Again, the question is, now, there could be two helium balloons, right? That's always possible. OK, now at arm's length to see if you can touch the balloon up there. Oh, <laughs> strong balloon. Now, we allow two chances. If you can't do it in two chances, I'm going to have to ask for another volunteer from the audience. OK. about whether we're producing any flammable, any noxious or poisonous gases, right? So let's look at the chemical reaction. This is a pretty simple chemical reaction that we just carried out. The balloon contained, those of you who guessed hydrogen were absolutely correct. That's H2. There are two hydrogen atoms together in a molecule of hydrogen. And it reacts with O2. Wait a minute, we didn't add any. What is O2? Oxygen. We didn't add any oxygen. Uh-oh, it shouldn't have worked. Oh, there's oxygen all around us. That's what we breathe, right? So we add oxygen and hydrogen. And what do they go together to form? Which is water. So did we make any poisonous gases? Now, I didn't see any rain in here. How did we make water? Oh, we made water in the gas phase. So sometimes we put a G in parentheses, because the, of the very high heat of that reaction, that water would not exist as a liquid. And there's only one other problem with this, and that is that you can see that the things don't quite add up right. We have one oxygen atom over here on the right, and we have two on the left. So we have to do something called balancing the equation. So how many molecules of, of uh, each of these, could we, this is, a, this is a tough question. I wasn't even planning to ask this one, but I've asked the question, how would we balance this equation so that we have the right number of molecules of hydrogen and oxygen reacting together to form a particular number of water? In the orange? Hey. Two, one, and forming how many of water then? So we have two O's over here, we need Two O's over here. So how many molecules of water being formed? Yes. Two. OK, good. So that now is the balanced equation for this experiment that we just did. OK, now let's go on and move more in the direction of biochemistry. And I would like to introduce this topic by 
showing you a few slides. If we could have the lights down, but not completely out. And let's turn our attention to the screen. And I'm going to introduce for you in uh, just a, about a minute and a half everything you need to know about what happens inside of your cells in terms of the information flow and information transfer. These are some of the molecules I'll be talking about throughout the hour. Now, information is stored in all cells in the form of the double helix of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And now maybe I've confused some of you already because I said information is stored. Well, what do I mean by information is stored? What, is, what, what do we mean by information? Yes, over here on the floor. You, yes. Blueprints of the body, and more particularly, the blueprints that tell the cells in the body how to make various proteins. The guy shown over on the right-hand side of this slide. So a protein could be something like pepsin, which is a stomach enzyme which is digesting your breakfast right now. Or it could be actin or myosin, which are proteins that are responsible for muscle movement. And each of those proteins has a different gene, a different piece of DNA, which is all that a gene is, that gives the blueprint, as you said, to the body the instructions on how to build that protein. Well, how does that process work? The information in the DNA is copied into a related molecule. You can tell it's related because the initials are sort of similar. RNA looks a lot like DNA. And in fact, they're chemically rather similar, but the RNA is just a single strand instead of a double helix. But that's OK, because each of the two strands of the DNA contains the entire blueprint. So all you need is one strand to have the information. And then the individual units or building blocks along the RNA are read out. And they come in four different chemical types. Sometimes I call them four different flavors. And each of those has an initial. Does any of you know what the four initials of the building blocks of DNA or RNA are? I usually ask this to high school groups, and they all know. Well, they're given symbols. Nobody wants to tackle that one? Yeah, here. Excellent. Well, yeah, very good. A, G, C, and then in RNA, the fourth one is U. In DNA, it's T. So there's a slight chemical difference between the RNA and DNA. So depending on the letters, uh, on the order of those four letters of the chemical alphabet, one produces a signal for a particular amino acid. So for example, if you have A, and then U, and then G, that triplet tells the cell to put a methionine amino acid in the protein at that point. Or if you have three U's in a row, you get phenylalanine. Now, the order that the amino acids are laid down into the protein determines how the protein will fold up, which in turn determines how the protein works. For example, an enzyme in your stomach that's chewing up your breakfast, or actin and myosin that are responsible for muscle movement. Now, a simple everyday analogy is shown at the bottom. The DNA is like a master gold seal archival copy of your favorite video. You can imagine that there's just one of these somewhere in the world, the master copy. And from that, you can make thousands of informationally identical copies by copying that tape. And that's the process of the master copy in DNA. It's analogous to the master copy of the information in DNA being transferred to RNA. And then, if you have the videotape, that isn't much fun to just have a nice library of videotapes unless you have some kind of a machine to read them out, right? And so that's the VCR machine, which is analogous to the cell's protein synthesis machinery. And then once you plug it into the machine, you get a final image on the television monitor, which is the useful end product of this information flow. And that's equivalent to the cell's protein. Now, what sort of studies that my laboratory does at CU is to focus on that molecule in the middle, the RNA molecule. Because it's been known for about 30 years 
that RNA, like DNA, is involved in this information transfer process. But what we found was that RNA, certain RNA molecules, also share with protein the ability to catalyze, and that means to speed up in a very specific way a biochemical reaction. And I'm going to be showing you two experiments that demonstrate how catalysis works with chemical reactions. But the same thing is happening on a very tiny scale inside of all of the cells of our body. And finally, I just want to show you a picture of one of these catalytic RNA molecules that we study here at the university. And it consists of a series of helical regions, and those are the twisted ribbons that you see on the screen. So that's sort of like a double helix that's not too different from the double helix of DNA. But the difference is that the RNA, instead of being a long, skinny, spaghetti-like molecule, sort of like a videotape, is this intricately folded molecule that folds back on itself many times, and in the center of that molecule, there's what we call an active site that allows this RNA molecule to catalyze biochemical reactions. Okay, so let's do another demonstration, if we could have the lights up a bit. That catalytic RNA that I just showed you needs a particular metal ion, it turns out to be magnesium in this case, in order to be a catalyst. It recruits metal ions that are present in all of our cellular environment, and it uses them to help speed up very specific chemical reactions. So how do chemists determine or analyze the, what kind of metal ions there are present in a sample? And the answer is that they burn them. Okay. That may sound silly, but I'll explain it in a minute. So you can burn substances, and from the light that's given off, you can determine what metal ions are present in a sample. So I need now six volunteers from the audience. And this is playing with matches. So I need six sort of middle-aged volunteers. How about the two of you girls back there? And um, yeah, you would be fine. You would be fine over here. And uh, you can come up, OK? And step right up and grab a pair of safety goggles here. And I thought we had six. Oh, we have two slow ones. Um, you can each come over here and get a book of ma a box of matches. You're going to need one match. And what we have are some here's your safety goggles. And we have some different salts of different metals present in each of these glass dishes. And then in order to keep the fire going, we have some methanol, so some methyl alcohol present. So grab the, your, you need this to strike the match on. So each of you grab one of those boxes. And on the count of three, strike your match. One, two, three. And, and just light your dish there. And once it lights, you can back off and return your safety goggles. And it's a defective match. There go. OK, thank you very much. And if we could now, uh, now you need to, whoa, we need to move these uh, boxes of matches. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And, now, if we could have the lights maybe all the way down, and if the camera could focus in on these. And you can see, uh, I think maybe you can see the colors almost better with your naked eye. But the, the different metal ions are copper over on this side, followed by strontium, followed by nickel, sodium, barium, and Calcium, And you can see that they each have a distinctive major color. This one is greenish. This one has uh, very much reddish tints. The nickel has, uh, I mostly see the blue flame. I don't think there's too much nickel salt in there. The sodium is a bright yellow. 
and the uh, barium is this beautiful green color. And so I'm going to now put out those flames by depriving these combustion reactions of their oxygen so that the flame goes off. And let's just look over on the overhead at what we've just shown. So why do different metal ions give different colors? We call this an emission spectrum. And at the beginning, before we light the flame, each of these different metals has an electron in its most stable state. This is called the ground state, or I've called it the resting state of the electron that's the one that's the, let's say, the one that's the least tightly bound to the nucleus of the atom. And now, when we light that, we've added some energy, right? So we have added a possible source of exciting the electron, and it can now get bumped up and move to a higher energy state. Now, that's not as stable a state. Just like gravity tends to make things fall downhill, an electron that's been bumped up to one of these higher energy states is not in such a stable situation, so it will tend to come back down eventually to this ground state. And when the electron moves back to a state of lower energy down to here or down to here, because of the conservation of energy, there has to be something else. If the electron is going from a high energy state to a low energy state, something else has to make up for that energy difference. And what happens is that light is given off. And the wavelength of the light, which will depend, remember it's the wavelength that determines whether the light looks red or green or blue or yellow, depends on the energy difference between these different states of the electron. And that, and uh, Max Planck had a, an equation that allows us in a very simple way, it may look complicated, but in a very simple way to calculate what that wavelength would be because depending on the energy difference between those two states, the higher the energy difference, the what? Maybe this is a question for the parents. If you have a high energy difference, do you get a longer or a shorter wavelength of light? If you have a big energy difference, you get a shorter wavelength of light because they're inversely proportional to each other. If you have a small energy difference, you get a larger uh, wavelength of light. So we can use the colors that are given off by the sample when it's burning to identify, and of course you use, scientists would use a more sophisticated instrument than just looking at it with your eye. You can actually very carefully monitor what uh, metal ions are present in a particular sample. At this point, I would like to do a little bit of alchemy. Now remember, the ancient alchemists tried to turn what into what? Somebody know? Up here in the blue sweater. Excuse me? Lead into gold. Or in fact, they would have been satisfied if they could turn anything into gold, <laughs> right? Well, we have a low budget for Mr. Wizard, so we can't turn anything into gold for you, but we're settled for turning something into silver, OK? because that's cheaper to do. <laughs> and so I need to put on my, um, now this will take me just a moment to get set up. And while I'm setting it up, um, perhaps I will let you look at the reaction that we're going to do. The reaction is very similar to one that takes place inside of your body when you eat sugar. So, pretty simple stuff, huh? This is, 
One thing I haven't warned you about is that most molecules inside of your body are much larger than molecules like hydrogen and oxygen and water. And so this sugar molecule with its chain of six carbon atoms and associated hydrogen and oxygen is actually small potatoes for a biological molecule. This is about the smallest thing that we get interested in and they get bigger from there. And during the metabolism of that sugar, the, an oxygen atom, which I've pinpointed in red, which I've colored in red so that you can follow it, you can see that this top part of the molecule, first of all, the molecule's sort of been split in half, and then in addition, so now it, it's only three carbons long, and in addition, there's an extra oxygen that's been added there, and that's called an oxidation reaction. And I'm going to show you an oxidation reaction which produces a particularly pretty um, result. So if I could have one volunteer, actually I need two volunteers from the audience, I, and one of them will just stand around for a minute. Um, how about uh, you in the red over here and the boy in the orange? And I would like the two of you to spend the next two minutes while I'm getting this all set up putting on gloves, because if you're not used to putting on gloves, it's going to take you about two minutes to get those on. Okay. So for the camera now, maybe the camera can zoom in over here, and I'm going to be making, now something turned very brown and ugly, and that turns out to be silver oxide, and I'm next going to add the next ingredient. So I'm doing a, um, a version, which is a chemical version, of what happens when sugars are oxidized in your body. But it has a particularly spectacular result. Okay. Now, we also need you to each be wearing your safety goggles. So if you could try to find a pair of goggles over there, that would be good. All right, now I'm going to add some glucose, which is a very common sugar, to this reaction. And now it has to be swirled. Now, can you hold this with your, I don't know if you're left-handed or right-handed, but just swirl, just now watch the motion here. See that? Very gentle like that, round and around. And don't drop it. And why don't you turn around so the audience can see you. Yeah, that looks good. Now, while you're doing that, I'm going to set up a second one of these. Because I'm going to give you one of these that you can take home with you. some sugar in this one, too. Now, I'm not really stalling here because this is a very slow chemical reaction. And you'll each see in a minute that we really needed all of this time before anything would happen. Is anything happening yet? Oh, looks like you got a little bit of action there. I'm going to take that, that one away from both of you and have you instead swirl these, okay? And I'll, I'll take the big one. Okay, now, if you, I don't know if the camera can look, can focus in on that. We have a beautiful silver, this was used to be glass, and there's a beautiful silver mirror. See, see how it reflects? That's been formed on the outside of this container. Okay, so let me just put it down there. Maybe you can 
um, focus on it better when I'm not holding on to it. But you can actually see, you can all come up and see it at the end. You can actually see yourself in it. So what is that particular reaction? Well, it's a chemical version of what happens in your body during sugar metabolism. So we did add the same sugar, glucose, that's a very common biological sugar, and some silver ions. Silver has the abbreviation AG+. And as the sugar gets oxidized, gets this red oxygen atom added to it, there's a corresponding reduction in the silver. The silver started out in a, as a silver salt, as a soluble form, Ag+, and then got converted into silver metal. So electrons are flowing in both directions. They're flowing from the glucose to make the acid and in the opposite direction from the silver ion to form the solid silver. And that's that solid silver that is being, now how are you doing? Do you have a mirror yet? Looks pretty good over here. Yep, yep, that looks good. How, how's yours? This fortunately is a fairly forgiving reaction. I, did, I sort of eyeballed the amounts of the ingredients and it still worked quite well. So we have a, um, how are your wrists holding up? Pretty good? This is great practice if you want to, um, you know, do cake batter or something. You just do this experiment for a few weeks and you can do anything. Okay, let's um, see if I can find my disposal jar here. These heavy metals, I'll, I'll take that from you just for a second and throw out the middle part and then you can keep what's, you can keep the silver mirror. We have to be very careful about disposal of these uh, heavy metals. So there you go. You can take off your, that's safe now. It's just a silver film and you can take off your glasses and I'll have yours ready for you in just a moment. I wish I could have done this for each of you, but I calculated and it would have taken 23 hours to set this up <laughs> for the entire audience. So that just wasn't an option. And thank both of you very much for your help. Um, now that reaction took a long time. It took several minutes. And if a reaction is going to take place in your body, it might have to take place, for example, a thousand times per second for it to be useful for a certain biological process. So living systems don't have the time to wait around swirling flasks for chemical reactions to take place. What do they do? They have biological catalysts which speed up those reactions. And the next two slides have uh, show some examples. I've already told you that RNA can be a catalyst. Here's one example, but if we go forward a couple of, oops, getting a little carried away. Here's the most common kind of catalyst within a living cell. It's a protein enzyme, and these are, I've already talked about these at the beginning. And this is a very nice example because you can clearly see what is typical of all the protein enzymes, although not always this dramatic in your body which is that there's a cleft, which is the right size and the right shape to hold in a particular small molecule or a particular couple of small molecules from the cell. In this case, the very same molecule that we used for the last experiment, the small sugar glucose shown in red. And you can see how its size is just dwarfed by this large catalyst. So the body builds these very large machines to properly and very specifically attract small molecules and to encourage them to undergo a particular chemical transformation at a rate that is sped up 
not usually by a million fold, but usually by a thousand million fold, or even a million million fold. So a billion or a trillion times faster than the reaction would take place if it were uncatalyzed. And as I've already said, RNA can also be a catalyst, and I showed you a ribbon model of an RNA catalyst, but when you fill in all of the atoms of the RNA catalyst, you can see that this red catalytic RNA, which is attached to and performing a reaction on another piece of RNA that's in a double helical form that's shown with the blue and white and yellow model, doesn't look that different from a protein catalyst. It's a globular molecule. It has an active site cleft. It has a very specific shape that will attract and hold into place another molecule. And then it has chemical groups arranged on it, which will encourage the other molecule to undergo a reaction. This one always reminds me of Godzilla climbing the Empire State Building. So the Godzilla is the RNA catalyst and the uh, RNA helix that's being acted upon in the reaction looks sort of like the Empire State Building. So let's do some visible reactions which allow us to see that, or allow us to demonstrate that principle of biological catalysis. And the first one is going to, I'm supposed to, yeah, it's holding well, check the temperature there. The first one is called Mr. Lincoln Glows. And the Mr. Lincoln in this experiment is a Lincoln penny. So I have a man that I would try to do everything over on this end. So let me move Mr. Lincoln. And in the beaker, I have some acetone, which is a fairly simple organic liquid, so it looks like water, but it is not. It has carbon and oxygen and hydrogen atoms, and I'll show you what acetone looks like in terms of its chemical formula in just a minute. And this acetone undergoes very slow decomposition, so slowly that you and I could sit here for the next week and it would slowly evaporate and we would have trouble detecting any of that decomposition. But I'll show you chemically what's happening on this overhead. That the acetone, which has these three carbon atoms, six hydrogen atoms, and one oxygen atom, can break apart to form a molecule called ketene and another molecule called methane. And you can sort of see that the methane comes from one of these parts of the molecule and that the ketene is formed by a slight rearrangement of the other part of the molecule. So this is called decomposition, just like when you make a compost pile, your garbage decomposes. Here we're talking about decomposition at the level of an individual molecule, okay? Now this reaction, I've already said, occurs very slowly if it's uncatalyzed. But if we catalyze it with a hot piece of, CU stands for what? University of Colorado, right? <laughs> copper, that's the chemical formula for copper. We can speed up this otherwise extraordinarily slow reaction. And I'll, by making everyone else wear safety goggles, I should wear them as well. Um, now, don't do this one at home. Um, so I, I simply have a Lincoln penny that is held in by a piece of wire, and I'm hoping the wire doesn't get hot too quickly here. Um, and I'm going to heat it up until the wire glows. Okay, looks pretty good. And then we're going to look at the ability of that copper 
uh, hanging right above the acetone. to catalyze the decomposition of the acid. Now, of course, the copper penny started out very hot, but it would very quickly cool off if it weren't for this chemical reaction that's taking place. And um, yeah, I think it's going pretty, pretty well. Maybe I can get it slightly closer to the the acetone. Maybe I can move the... Okay, so now that penny is going to continue to glow because as the decomposition, and you can see waves of heat, I think, coming across the... F oh, I'm sorry, instead of Mr. Lincoln, that's the backside. Okay, this is not Mr. Lincoln glows, this is the Lincoln Memorial glows, I think. <laughs> uh, the penny's turned around the other way. But in any case, it's, you can see waves of heat coming across that penny. And if we turn off the lights, I think you'll be able to see the penny glowing. And it will glow for, it doesn't look too impressive on the big screen. But I think those of you who are in the front 20 rows can see directly that, that, that there's a glowing penny right above that acetone. That will continue for hours until all of the acetone has decomposed. You see it? Okay. Well, I'll just leave it up here, and maybe you can, we can come look at it later. Now, if I could have the lights on again, so why does the decomposition cause the glowing? Where's the heat coming from? Well, the ketene and the methane are both undergoing combustion in the presence of oxygen to produce, again, harmless gases. CO2 is what? Carbon dioxide. You all know that one because the solid form of it is what? Dry ice, which you use to keep ice cream bars cold. And then water is the other product. And then the other thing that's being produced in that combustion is heat. And enough heat's being produced to keep that penny glowing. And the hot penny then continues to catalyze the decomposition of more acetone. So that'll just continue until it's all gone. Now, one final demonstration of catalysis. Well, I guess we can just ask the question then, what is a, a catalyst? And a catalyst is something that then speeds a reaction. It does that by providing a new pathway for the reaction. In the case of the copper catalyst, it provides a surface on which the molecule can lay out in a particular way that facilitates it breaking into two. It participates in the reaction only transiently. And you can see that later on. If you come up here, you'll see Mr. Lincoln has not disappeared. He's n he is not being decomposed. The copper is participating transiently in the reaction, but it's not disappearing. And finally, and, and, and because it participates only transiently, it's then restored in its initial form. In other words, this is nature's way of recycling. These catalysts can essentially be used an endless number of times. Now, I would like to do one more example of such a reaction. And for this, I need some volunteers from the audience. How about you in the green uh, shirt, Jennifer and Sarah next to her? I happen to know these girls. It's not a random <laughs> choice from the audience. And if you could come up here and put on your safety goggles. Try not to step on the balloon as you do so. And one of you, I would like to, let's see, I think we ought to, this is a pretty tricky one, so that's not, we either need smaller safety goggles or larger heads, one or the other. Well, that's probably good enough. Here, why don't you slip on these gloves? 
And we are going to look at the decomposition of, and so it's another decomposition reaction, if you wouldn't put on these gloves. This time of a molecule, I'm sorry that all of these are such complicated formulas, but I chose the simplest molecules that I could to do the job. We're going to take this molecule, which contains four carbons. It's called tartrate. We're going to mix it with some hydrogen peroxide, and then we're going to see it decompose. And you can see, I won't bother you with the details, but look over here. Two of the products of the reaction are oxygen and carbon dioxide, and that we're going to start out with liquids. If the reaction works, it'll produce oxygen and carbon dioxide, which means we should look for what? Explosion. Will oxygen and carbon dioxide explode? How about back there in the red jacket? Yeah. Bubbles. Great. That's exactly the perfect answer. Bubbles. So if it works, we should see bubbles. Now, Jennifer, if you would come over here, and I would like you to do, actually, Sarah, you can do the first thing. This is the tartrate that I just showed up on the board. This is hydrogen peroxide. And I would like you to very carefully pour all of that. Does it, does it, wait, wait, wait just a second. Can the camera see that, or should I move it closer? Are we okay there? We're sort of okay. Yeah. yeah it's, the contrast isn't isn't too great, but let me see if I put a. Is that helper? hurt to have a different colored background in the back. Well, let's do it anyway. Okay. Now, Sarah, if you would pour in the... Yes, all of it. Just pour it in there and... And then, Sarah, stir it up with the stir bar. And what's happening? Want me to take my shirt off, Dave? <laughs> Only John Taylor does that. Um, what's happening, Sarah? Nothing, right? <laughs> Nothing is happening. What do we need to add to make this work? What do we need to add to speed up a chemical reaction? A catalyst. Okay, Jennifer, here's uh, Dave Nez, but what a guy. He'll give you the shirt off his back just for the sake of science. Little does he know that this is going to destroy his shirt. Uh, I, I think we can see. I mean, not much is happening, right? It's very slow. Actually, can you see, Sarah, can you see there are little, very slow bubbles formation? Okay, now this, does, can the camera check this? Can, can you see the color of this? It's a beautiful, what, Jennifer? What would you call it? Reddish color? Yeah. And that's a cobalt chloride catalyst. So pour that. Whoa, wait, wait, just a minute. Put that on a little bit here. Okay, pour that in. Okay, and stand back so everybody can see it. Well, the reaction has sped up <laughs> several thousand fold. And it changed color. It's no longer pink, but now it's green. And boy, it sped up so much that the reaction is already quieting down. It's all over. And what's happening to the color? It's turning red again. Well, who would like to give an explanation of how we went from pink to green back to pink or red again? Here in the black shirt? Yeah, you. <coughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, his answer is just perfect. What he said, for those of you who didn't hear it, is that the chemicals started, formed a complex. They got together, he said, which is exactly right. And that gave a novel color. So when the tartrate got together with the cobalt, from the cobalt chloride, it formed a transient complex, which was a greenish color. 
that complex is much more reactive than the tartrate would be free in solution. And then it quickly decomposes. And after the reaction's over, the catalyst leaves. And then that very nicely illustrates. And thank you, girls, for your help. Let's give them a hand for. <laughs> so that illustrates all of the features, I think, of catalysis as we would find in a biological system. That the catalyst certainly sped up the reaction. You could see that the bubbles were forming very quickly with the catalyst in there. It provided, well, what you didn't really know is that it provided a new pathway, except you could sort of tell that because of that green color. Some novel chemical species was being formed, but it part was formed only transiently as evidenced by the fact that the color returned to the original. So the catalyst was recycled. In fact, if our university budget gets any lower, we may be at the point where we will actually recycle this cobalt chloride for the next Mr. Wizard show. I think as it is, we can still afford the 29 cents to throw that away <laughs> and use some new cobalt chloride the next time we do the experiment. So finally, I'm almost done. I don't have any more whiz-bang stuff to show you today. But I would like to return one last time. You, you've noticed I've been jumping back and forth between chemical reactions, which we can observe, biochemical reactions, that those of us in the laboratory have developed ways of looking at them indirectly, but we certainly can't look at them in quite the same way that we do these simple chemical analysis. I'd like to return one last time to the biochemical world and tell you children and perhaps of more interest to the parents in the audience a little bit about one of the directions that we're going with biological catalysis in the sense of RNA catalysis in our research lab. So if we could have the slides, and I think there are only three more of these to go through. We don't even need our safety goggles for these. These catalytic RNA molecules have a very interesting activity. They can associate with other RNA molecules in the test tube or in living cells or in living organisms. And the other RNA, so the catalytic RNA molecule in the upper left is shown in sort of a steely blue color. And it can find out amongst all of the RNA molecules in the cell, it can pick out a particular one which matches it. And I'll define that in a little bit more in the next slide. And that other molecule is shown in pink. And when everything gets lined up, some chemistry takes place, sped up by the particular active site that's formed by this catalyst. And what happens is shown on the lower left-hand corner, this little sort of explosion that the artist drew means that the pink RNA molecule is being broken in half. And when you break an RNA molecule in half in the cell, you inactivate it. It's no longer useful. And then the catalyst, just like the RNA catalyst, just like any good catalyst, re can release those pink strands and it's back to the upper left-hand corner. So it can go around and around and around that cycle over and over and over again. Well, why would it be useful medically to destroy particular RNA molecules? Does anyone happen to know of an RNA molecule you would like to get rid of? Yes, over here, a candidate. You, in the... Cancer, so that's a good, a good answer because all cancers are caused by particular RNA molecules, which make particular proteins, being made in a cell, either in too great of a quantity or at the inappropriate time, so that the cell is encouraged to divide and divide and divide instead of being subject to the normal sort of growth regulation. So certainly ca all cancers are associated with either the absence of an essential RNA or the overproduction of an RNA that's normally supposed to be produced 
in a small amount or some kind of a mutated RNA has been made that leads to the cancer state. Any other, ex any other types of, yes, over here in the, yes, AIDS. So that's a good example. The HIV virus, human immunodeficiency virus, which is thought to be the causative agent of AIDS, is itself an RNA molecule wrapped up in protein. And the active part of it is the RNA molecule itself. So that's an RNA molecule we'd like to get rid of. Another candidate down here? Yeah, in the, you, the girl. Tumors? So that's related, tumors was said, that's related to cancer, which we've mentioned, that's a good answer. In the boy next to, no? Anybody had a cold lately? How, raise your hand if you've had either the cold or the flu in the last month. Wow, that's, I, I would say impressive, but I think it's depressive. Yes, so both the cold vi virus and the flu virus are also examples. And it's very easy to design ribozymes to associate, and ribozyme is our word for these catalytic RNA molecules, to associate with any given RNA. So that RNA showing on the top could be a flu virus RNA, it could be a cold virus, it could be an RNA responsible for cancer, it could be an RNA from the HIV uh, virus, and in any case we can make an RNA that will match to that RNA. And the way that we do that is by just following the rules of double helix formation. So somebody before knew the four letters of the alphabet. Do any, so if you, we have to use those now. The N's and the N primes haven't been specified because they can be anything. But if you have an A, or let's, let's say if you have a G in the um, virus RNA, what do you have to put across for it to pair with a G? Have any of you had this in school? What pairs with G? C. Right? And what, so if you, every time you have a G here, you put a C across from it. Any time you'd have a U here in the target, what would you put across from it in the ribozyme? Down here. An A. Right, because A pairs with U. And so you're all now ribozyme engineers. If you have an RNA, you want to destroy. If it's got an A, you put a U opposite. If it's got a U, you put an A. Where it's got a G, you put a C. Where it's got a C, you put a G. And then this part you leave alone and this part folds up around this part of the target RNA and sort of punches a hole in it. It cuts it at that point and thereby inactivates it. And so this is the sort of application of our basic research that people are now trying very hard to develop as a pharmaceutical. It's something that we had no inkling that was a possibility when we made the the basic science discovery that RNA could be a catalyst. And it took quite a few years, perhaps we're slow learners, but it took quite a few years for us to come to the realization that there might be something useful that could be done with this concept. And this sort of technology, designing ribozymes to attach to and catalyze the cleavage of other RNA molecules, works very rapidly, very specifically, and with very high efficiency in the test tube, in plastic test tubes under controlled laboratory conditions. It's harder to get it to work in living cells, but there have now been quite a few successful demonstrations of its utility in cells growing on petri dishes under artificial conditions. And it'll be an even harder step yet to get it to work in an entire organism, and that's the challenge that lies ahead in the coming years. I thank you. We can have the lights back up. I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and ha have a great Saturday. It's a beautiful day outside. If anyone wants to come up and look at any of these closer up, feel free.